All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6 and then also Acts chapter 27. So I'm going to read a story in each one of these, an Old Testament and New Testament story. And I'm going to talk to you today, as, as I mentioned last week, on the topic of how to give hope to the hopeless. How to give hope to the hopeless. And as you saw Nathan put that last song, Anchor, in the last uh, worship set, uh, that he is the, the, the anchor, the, this hope is the anchor for our souls, right? And that's what the scripture says. So 2 Kings chapter 6 and Acts 27. If you're there, if you're there, say I'm there. If you're not, say I'm not. All right, well, you got, <laughs> we got paper notes. If you don't have our app, you can download our church app. The note's on there as well. Um, so 2 Kings 6, 8 through 17. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not go near the place of the Arameans, or, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on alert there. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officers together and demanded, which one of you is the traitor? He's like, man, I got a rat in the camp. Who's, who's telling on me here? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord, the king. One of the officers replied, Elisha, the prophet, and Israel tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak and the prophecy of your bedroom, right? He was getting prophetic words and, and letting the king of Israel know. Go out and find where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back. Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir! What will we do now? What will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. How many of y'all know these were not natural horses. This was, it was a supernatural, right? It was actually an angelic force that was surrounding uh, the area that Elisha and his servant was at. So you can see the young man freaked out. They were vastly outnumbered by a garrison, a, a, an army of, of soldiers and horses and chariots. So now let's go to Acts 27, and I'm going to read this one, and then we're going to look at uh, this, what I'm talking to you about from both of these stories. In Acts 27, I want to set it up first. Acts uh, chapter 21, the apostle Paul was arrested in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel. After this, he went before the Jewish high council and several government officials. And now he's a prisoner on a ship heading to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. During this journey, they run into a terrible storm. That's where we're going to pick up the story. Acts 27, 20, the terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars. Now watch this, until at last... All hope was gone. See that? They were hopeless. It said all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone selling with you. Isn't it awesome? And just because God's good, he'll do, he does certain things, right? God in his goodness will, will keep you safe. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Verse 33, drop down, just as dawn, day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. You have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair on your heads will perish. Then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged, and all began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. Verse 44, so everyone escaped 
safely to shore. If you read the story, the ship didn't actually make it. They got stuck on a reef. The waves pounded it, broke it up, but everyone was able to jump off the ship and swim or float safely to the Isle of Malta. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you are our source of hope, Lord God. And, and I pray if there's anyone in here that's feeling hopeless today, that they would have hope before they leave, Lord, today. And that we, if we know people that are ho- hurting and hopeless, that, Lord, we would offer them the hope that is only found in you. Help me today as I preach your word, Lord. I cannot do this on my own, nor do I want to, Holy Spirit. I need your help. Help us as we receive it to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. In these two stories, we see both Elisha and Paul giving hope to those that were hopeless. There are many people around us that are either battling something and they feel surrounded, or they're in the worst storm of their lives and they feel hopeless, right? You may be in here today. Sometimes you feel like you're in a battle and the enemy's surrounding you. Are you in the storm of your life? And it just seems like, like they said on that ship, all hope was gone. We can offer hope to a hopeless world. Amen. So I want to show you from these two stories, how to give hope to the hopeless. Number one, pray that their eyes will be opened. Now listen to me. I didn't just say pray. I'm being very specific from this story. Pray that hopeless people's spiritual eyes would be open. I'm not hearing much today. I hope your eyes are physically open and not falling asleep on me today. Look at 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on one side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let them see, or let him see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. You know, if that was my servant... And maybe you too, we quite possibly would have prayed that this young man would have peace. Maybe, because he was freaking out, right? Lord, just calm his little heart, bless his little heart. You know how your grandma says, bless that little heart, right? Bless him, Lord, give him peace. But no, that's not what Elisha prayed. He said, Lord, I pray you open his eyes. Open his spiritual eyes to see. All he's looking at is in the natural the real army, but he prayed because Elisha knew in the spiritual realm there was way more that were on their side. There was an army of horses and chariots of fire, an angelic force that was surrounding him, and that's what Elisha prayed. You see, this is the thing. The servant was living by sight and not by faith. What does the Bible tell us to do? Live by faith, not by sight, right? He was doing the opposite. He was focused on only what he can see in the natural, and so he lost hope. He was freaking out. He was scared. You see, and this is one of the main reasons so many people walking around today are hopeless, because they're focused only on the natural. They're focused only on their natural circumstances instead of having faith in the God who's above all circumstances. Amen? And so you may be hopeless in here today, too. Again, this is a 2-4. This is more of an evangelistic message. Again, as I'm trying to encourage you to help people, to encourage people, invite people to Easter. Again, grab the, 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 the graphic that's on our social media platforms and share it, like it, text it to people, you know, screenshot it, invite people to come to church on Sunday. St- statistics show way more people not only open to come to church, but open to the gospel during times of like Easter and Christmas. So there's people around us all around that, that are, that are struggling and we need to pray that their eyes of faith would be open, right? Here's a good verse to pray over them. Uh, Psalm 105 and 4. And the message says, keep your eyes open for God. Watch for his works. Be alert for signs of his presence. Man, that's good stuff right there. See, if you're feeling hopeless today, if you're, if you worried, as it said too, they were so worried on that ship, they couldn't even eat. Keep your eyes open for God. Watch for his works. Be alert to what he's doing. Amen. You ever been so worried that you didn't even, you couldn't even eat? Sadly, I've been worried before, but that never was a problem. I could still eat. So, but maybe you or somebody else, right? Or, you know, was so worried you couldn't eat, you couldn't sleep, right? And, and you're just focusing in on that problem so much. We got to pray that our eyes, their eyes would be open and yours as well. I pray that for you. Also pray that they would see that God still sees them. Let me say that again. Pray that their eyes would be open to see that God still sees them, whether they're in a battle or in a storm. Look at Exodus 3, 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. So we see he's seen them, but watch this. And I am concerned about their suffering. Oh, pray that the Lord will open their eyes or your eyes if you're feeling hopeless to see that God not only sees you. It's one thing to see and say, okay, I see you right there. But I'm concerned 
about your suffering. I'm concerned about what's going on in your everyday life. We know if the father's eyes on the sparrow, as we know it is in Matthew 10, 29, right? Then you could be sure that he sees everyone. If he keeps an eye on every bird in the sky, his eyes on you as well. And he's concerned. And, and on those that are around us, we need to pray and let them know that. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer in this area or any other area. I used this scripture last week and I'm going to use it again. Speaking of healing, James 5 is the context, but think about praying to open your spiritual eyes. James 5, 16, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Amen? So the righteous, that word, the righteous, when we get saved, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We're in right standing with God. So you might say, yeah, but Brandon, my prayers aren't that effective because, you know, I don't read my Bible as much as I should. Well, you know what? It's good to read your Bible more, but your prayers can still be effective. And again, be specific. If we were honest, myself, a lot of us probably don't pray this way. When's the last time you prayed somebody's spiritual eyes would be open? Maybe you do. I pray this for, for those that are lost a lot, but not in the context of hopelessness. Pray that they would see that God sees them and that he's working on their behalf. And here's the, the, the last thing on this point. You know, even just offering to pray for somebody gives people hope. When people are hopeless and they're hurting and they feel lost or beaten down or, or, or you know, in a battle or a storm, you just saying, hey, man, I'm going to be praying for you. Just that a lot of times will give people hope. But let me encourage you. If you tell somebody you're going to pray for them, do it. Yeah. Follow through, right? What I like to do, and of course, we get a lot of prayer requests. If somebody asks me to pray for them, I try to pray for them right there on the spot, right? I try to stop. And uh, there was a lady earlier, and she didn't ask me, but just going through something. And I just right there, I just knelt down and wanted to pray with her. Because, you know, just knowing. And listen, somebody shoot you a text call. Listen, it don't have to be the biggest, most, you know, drawn out prayer. But just take a minute and lift them up heartfelt in faith and ask God to open their eyes to see that he sees them, and that he has a provision, maybe even of an angelic being surrounding their life. Amen? Number two, point them to the Word of God. Point them to God's Word. His Word, and I'll show you in a minute, is our only source of hope. Jesus himself, we know he's the living Word, but he's given us the written Word, his Word. It's God's Word that gives us hope in the midst of a battle or peace in the midst of the storm. You know, a woman told uh, the great evangelist D.L. Moody that she had found a wonderful promise in God's word that gave her peace in times of trouble. And she quoted Psalm 56, 3, which is a great promise. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Moody said he had a better promise for her. And he quoted Isaiah 12, 2. See, God has come to save me. I will trust him and not be afraid. In our day and age, D.L. Moody, he went up there, right? And he's like, I got one better. I mean, those are both great scriptures. But what he was saying was, instead of waiting till you're afraid to trust God, if you trust God through it all, you won't be afraid. Amen? But that's just a point I'm just sharing is that, you know what? That lady was saying, I'm, I'm getting rooted in D.L. Moody. I'm getting rooted in God's word. I'm, my source of hope is not a person. It's not a circumstance. It's not a check. It's not a promotion. It's in the word of God, right? It makes you wonder what promises the Lord uh, of the Lord maybe came to Elisha's mind when they were surrounded by that great garrison, that great army, and, and, and his, his servants freaking out. And he's, he's encouraging them that more on our side than on theirs. Makes you wonder what he may have, some of the, the scriptures that, that uh, Elisha maybe thought about. Maybe he remembered David's words in Psalm 23, 7. If an army surrounds me, I will not be afraid. If war breaks out, I will trust in the Lord. Or maybe the words of Moses, Deuteronomy 20, 30 and 4. Today, when you go into battle, don't be afraid of the enemy. And when you see them, don't panic, right? Because the, 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 that's exactly what the, the servant did. He panicked when he saw the army. But it says, the Lord your God will fight alongside you and will help you win the battle. Amen? So we don't know for sure. I just Those are some scriptures that quite, quite frankly could have came into his mind. But we do know for sure. The word that Paul got from the Lord for both him and all the people that were on that ship remembered I was heading for Rome. Look at Acts 27 and 21 and 24 again. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have in, in, listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. First of all, Paul starts out by saying, I told you so. You should have listened to me. But then he says, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, I love this, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. First, Paul addresses the crew by scalding them for not listening to him. But then he encouraged them with the angel's assurance 
of all their survival. The reason Paul was able to give hope through God's word, listen to me, is because he had hope in God's word. We can't offer people hope that, that we don't have. Is your hope solely rooted in God's word? Because if it's not, and if it's doubted, and it's just something that I heard, you know, Pastor Kelly said, you know, in a message, and, and this might help you, you know, good luck. That ain't going to work, right? You have to be rooted. Paul knew he was rooted. His faith alone was rooted in the hope of the word of God. And where does this hope come from? From a close and personal relationship with the Lord. Look at that. It, it spells it out clear. Look at what Paul said again. The God to whom I belong. Come on, that's sonship. He said, I belong to God. I'm his son. To God whom I belong and whom I serve, who I'm walking with, how I'm living my life for, I love this, stood beside me and he said. Isn't that awesome? It shows clearly Paul was in a close relationship with him. I belong to him. I'm his son. I serve him. And last night even, he was close beside me. Can I say right now, if you're in a storm, the Lord's standing right beside you. He's right there beside you. And I promise you, he's either speaking to you or he wants to speak to you. But you got to open your word. You got to get in. You got to be listening to his voice. You got to open his word, open your Bible that contains his word, right? Again, we can't point people to the word if it's not personally our source of hope. Look at Psalm 119, 114. You are my refuge and my shield. Your word is the source of hope. Amen? Your word is the source of hope, right? And again, let me encourage you. Not only do you have to believe the word and that's your hope, you can't encourage people, point people to the word, give them a word if you hadn't been in the word yourself. You got to know the word. You got to have some word in you to be able to encourage somebody, right? You know, years ago, uh, a lady who's still in this church, she called the office. She was working at a drug rehab place here in Scott, and they had people from all over the country. It was a 30-day rehab. People from all over the country would come uh, to this program, and she asked if we would go and do like a Bible study with them. I was like, absolutely. I shared my story with her. She said, well, man, you'd be perfect. I just, I was covering the office that day. I happened to take the call and she said, would you mind coming? I said, not at all. And really what I would do, it wasn't really, I wouldn't consider it a Bible study. What I would do is I'd go and share my story, which I'll talk about in a minute. I would go and share my story with them and I would bring my Bible and then I would lay out the gospel and offer them hope and offer them salvation, right? And many of them gave their life to Christ. It was cool. I saw a couple of them afterwards in town working and doing well. Well, after one of the, the times meeting with the people that were in the program, there was a lady on staff there and her boyfriend was like working maintenance or something there. So when I walked out, we started talking. And he said, so you're a pastor, huh? I said, yeah. And he, he started talking about it and he, he just brought it up. He said, well, you know what? I'm mad at God. I said, really? Tell me why you're mad at God. He said, because he took my mom early. My mom died of cancer and he took my mom early. And so I'm mad at him for that. I said, really? I said, okay, well, listen, I said, and, and, and just in that moment, the Lord brought me to John 10, 10, where Jesus said, the thief's purpose is to come to kill, to steal and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I shared that scripture with him. I said, listen, God didn't take your mom out. If you're going to blame anybody, according to this verse, blame the devil. Amen. And he, it's like, you can see the light bulb go off. And he even told me, he said, I've never heard that before. I didn't know that was in the Bible. See, just in that moment, I didn't have, I, I wasn't thinking of John 10, 10, but in that moment, the Lord reminded me of John 10, 10 in that. And I didn't try to like, oh, you shouldn't be mad at God or any of that. I just gave him one verse. And not only was he open and his, his countenance changed, he's like, wow, man, I never heard that. He said, would you mind meeting with me? Could we have lunch one day? I said, absolutely. And we did. I went to have lunch with him one day and I got to further minister to him. Amen. Because I gave him one verse of scripture. That changed his way of thinking about God all the way around, right? We, you know, people die for a lot of different reasons, but I read my Bible and Jesus said, it's the enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So, and he comes to give us an abundant life. Amen. And you got to know that as well. Maybe some of you, that might set you free. You may be mad at God for something because you think God took somebody out or took somebody and all that kind of stuff. You know, I know an abundant life is, is, is not a life cut short full of sickness and stuff. Amen. He comes, we, we live in a sinful world, a fallen world, and we have a real adversary as the enemy. Amen. So you need to know things like that. And, you know, when you get in the word, you can encourage people with that, right? And then also encourage them to get in the word for themselves. Whether they're a believer, they might be a believer that feels hopeless. You may be in here today or someone even that's not saved. Encourage them. Say, hey, man, you know, this is maybe something. And again, it could be something that helped you through a storm that you went through in your life and this scripture or verses helps you during this time so you can say, hey, I want to share this with you, 
right? Or something you read that morning, but eventually encourage them, hey, you need to read the Bible for yourself, amen? You know, there's some people that have gotten saved, radically born again from sitting there reading their Bible in their room by themselves, amen? And so we need to point them to the Word. Thirdly, your faith can help them have hope. So we, we need to pray their eyes be open. We need to point them to the Word of God. And our faith in that Word, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Our faith can help them have hope. Going straight from the, the, the story again, look at Acts 27, 25. Paul said, so take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. See, Paul was trying to stir, help stir up hope in their hearts for the people on that ship declaring his faith in the word of the Lord. Now, he got what's called a rhema word. He got a word directly from the Lord. You know, in Greek, there's the, lo, the, the logos, which is the written word of God. And there's, there's a rhema word, a spoken word from God. And that's what he got. He got a word directly from God through an angel. And he believed that word, right? And it helped give hope to the others. Look at what Hebrews 11 one says. To have faith is to be sure of the things we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. See, he had faith that what he was hoping for would come true because of the word that he got, right? He had faith in that word. And let me, again, your faith has to be anchored in Christ and his word. Uh, you, you can't, and, and to give people hope, it can't be like just a, out of boy, you're going to do it, don't give up, go ahead, keep going, right? I mean, you can encourage somebody, but that's not going to last. Self-help tips or a motivational speech is not going to get people out of their storm and their battle, right? They got to be anchored in the Lord and anchored in his word. And see, and this goes back to Elisha's servant. He didn't have faith, so he couldn't see in the spirit the chariots of fire that the Lord sent, right? He was looking only in the natural. He didn't have faith. So once he prayed that his eyes would be open, he could see, and then he had faith like, okay, you know. And by the way, the rest of that story is, it's really cool. Elisha prays that the servant's eyes would be open to see the chariots of fire. And then when the, uh, then he turns around and prays that the enemy's eyes would be blinded. If you read the rest of the story, that's what happened. All of these armies, warriors came down and, and when they got to Elisha and his servant, the, the Lord blinded them so they didn't know who he was. He said, well, who are you looking for? And he tells them, he's like, oh no, that man's not around here. You need to go over here. And he redirected them and sent them right to the path of the Israelite army, right? So it's really cool. He prayed one's eyes would be open and one's eyes would be blinded. And he won that battle with prayer. They didn't have to lift a sword. They didn't have to call on an army because he had faith and the hope of the word of God and used his powerful prayer that produces wonderful results. God gave them a victory. Amen. Fourth and final thing, your personal story will give people hope. And this is probably all of them are powerful. But in, in when you're sharing with somebody, your personal story will give people hope. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him, talking about Satan, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and what? The word of their testimony. Right? Another word of saying uh, your story is your testimony. It's to testify to people of what Jesus has done for you in your storm, in your trial, in your life, right? And that gives so much people hope. See, just as Jesus is the source of hope, Satan is the source of hopelessness. Isn't that right? And we help others overcome hopelessness by our testimony. So we need to share our story, right? I love that. So people, sh you know, you, you may have a hard time like, man, I don't know how to witness to people or evangelize to people. I don't know that much of the Bible. You don't have to know that much of the Bible. One of the most powerful encounters of someone sharing their testimony in the Gospels is the man that Jesus healed who was blind. He was before the religious leaders that were asking him all kind of questions about who Jesus was, where he's from, if he was a sinner, all of that. And this is what the man said. He said, I don't know about all of that. I know this. I was blind and now I can see. Amen. That's all he said. I was blind. Now I can see. That's all I can tell you. I can't tell you Greek and Hebrew and all that kind of. I just know this, that my life was one way and then I met Jesus and now it's another way. And your story and specifics of your story can help people in your life. I love this. This is what Paul said. I, I never really looked at this scripture. I pray it almost weekly and I've read it and preached it, but I've never looked at it as a, as Paul like really uh, sharing like a testimony in the scripture. And a lot of y'all know it, Philippians 4, 19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches were given to us in Christ Jesus. Keep that up there, Doug. You see that? He's saying, look, this same God took care of me. He provided my needs. And, and, and so now I'm going to encourage you that he's going to supply all of your needs too. 
He started out by letting them know God is taking care of me and he's going to take care of you too. I love that. Paul was really sharing a testimony of God's provision in his life, right? See, we need to do the same thing. We need to share our story. You have a story. If you've come to Christ, if you've been born again, God has touched you. He's delivered you. He's helped you. I'm telling you, every time I share my story, and, and many of you have heard my story, but I actually met a few new people that I've never met before, first time here. And again, welcome, I guess. So good to have you. You know, but my story is that, you know, I was, I started smoking weed at about 14 years old, 15 years old. And then as I went further into high school and outside of high school, started doing a lot of drugs. So for 10 years, I was a drug addict and an alcoholic and selling drugs and doing all this crazy stuff. At 19 years old, my dad committed suicide, which sent me on a, a, a tailspin even further down into drugs, alcohol, depression, not having any purpose, hopelessness. I felt hopeless. On the surface, I was acting like everything was good. I had a good job and all that kind of stuff. But inside, I felt hopeless. And until I tell you exact date, July 10th, 2002. It's going to be 20 years this July. I was sitting right back there. I walked down this very aisle, and right here, I gave my life to Christ. And he radically saved me. And he changed me. Amen? And he began to deliver me and set me free from drugs and alcohol and depression and begin to heal my broken heart from the tragic death of my dad and show me Psalm 68, 5, that God is a father to the fatherless, right? And so I share my story. And how long did that take, by the way? About two minutes, right? Three minutes. That's my story. I share that with people and just that quick. And sure enough, every, not every time, but a lot of times when I share my story just like that, people come up and say, man, thank you for sharing. And a young man came up to me after the first service and walked right here and said, thank you for sharing your story. And he actually just got free from drugs and alcohol about four or five years ago. But it choked him up and he said, man, it just touches me that you would share that. And it just encourages me to continue to keep going. Amen. So listen, you may not have the same story as me, the same testimony. It might not be drugs, alcohol, a tragic death of a loved one, but you have a story. You have a testimony. And when we were youth pastors, you know, I, we used to always encourage our students to go evangelize and witness, tell people about Jesus in their schools. And we take them to the mall and football games and you teach them classes on how to evangelize and all that. But people would say, yeah, but Pastor Brandon, I don't have a good testimony like you do. Every testimony is a good testimony, Right. No matter what it is, like me and Pastor Kelly, Pastor Todd, a lot of us have the same story. I would tell them like, yeah, but I, didn't, I never went through all this stuff y'all went through. Like, I, I just grew up in church. I got saved early. I'm still in church. I'm like, brother, that's a testimony. That's awesome that you haven't gone away. You ain't got to experience all the craziness and the pig slop we experience in the world. What a, what a great testimony. And it can encourage other kids to stay faithful to the Lord all the days of their lives. So I don't know what you've been through or what you're going through, but your story can give people hope. That's, I have found the most powerful thing is sharing my story. Again, it happened again this morning. It gave this young man hope and just encouraged him. Even though he's been set free, you know, he, he just it encouraged him to continue on. And I, and I do that time and time again. So as I close today, you may be the one, as I, I referenced a few times during this service, that's feeling hopeless. The source of hope is the same. Give you a few more scriptures before we wrap it up. Psalm 33, 20. We put our hope in the Lord, right? He is our shield and hope. If you're feeling hopeless today, you got to put your hope in the Lord and his word. Psalm 33, 22, let your unfailing love surround us. Come on, just like those chariots of fire surrounded them. Let your love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Is your hope in Christ alone? Or is it in something else and Christ? Come on, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. That's it, right? Him and him alone, right? And so we've got to put our hope in him alone. Listen, and it may take a while, sometimes to come out of the storm or the fight of the battle, but keep hoping, even if it takes a while. Look what the psalmist said, Psalm 119, 81. I am worn out waiting for your rescue. You ever felt worn out in the battle you in or the storm? But look what he says, I will put my hope in your word. In other words, it doesn't matter how long it takes. I might get worn out. I might get beat up. I might, but Lord, I'm still hoping in you, he, you knowing that you're going to rescue me. And listen, let me encourage you, rejoice while you wait. Romans 12, 12 says, rejoice in our confident hope, right? Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Isn't that awesome? We can rejoice even while we're waiting in our confident hope. Be patient. Sometimes trouble lasts, but the Lord's, remember, right there beside us. He has an army encamped around us, right? We can anchor our hope in his word, and we're going to end where we started and keep on praying, right? 
Come on, pray if you're feeling hopeless. Pray for those that are hopeless around you, that their eyes be open, right? Point them to the Word. Come on, your faith, you you anchor your hope and your faith in the Word, and they'll see that. I believe your faith will be contagious, I think, just like Paul's was, right? And share your story. Come on, as you, as you invite, not just because it's Holy Week, but, man, tell people your story. Tell them how Jesus changed their life. Invite them to Easter. Continue to. Listen, if you're not sure, like, okay, well, I can lay out the, the, the my story and give them hope, but, man, I'm not sure about laying out the gospel. Hey, invite them to church on Sunday. I'll lay it out for them. Amen? We all got our part to do, right? Paul said, one water, one planted, the Lord brought the increase, right? And so I've always encouraged people to do that, the same thing. But even that is simple. Hey, how do you how do you lead somebody to Christ? Just let them know. Listen, ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and declare that He's your Lord and Savior. Surrender your life to Him and you will be saved, right? It's really not complicated. It's very simple. Jesus said you gotta have faith like a child. I think we overcomplicate the gospel sometimes, right? It's more genuine and in what you believe in your heart, which means the trust, than what we say, right? Amen. Like in a minute, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer because you may be hopeless today because you've never even gone to the true source of hope. Last scripture, and we're going to pray, Matthew 12, 21. This is speaking of Jesus, and it says, and his name will be the hope of the world. The hope of the whole world is found again in the name as we started of Jesus Christ, right? As we sang about this morning, as we remembered what he did, as we took communion, as we prayed, He is our source of hope. Do you have hope that you're going to spend eternity with Christ? Because the truth is, we're all going to spend eternity somewhere. And again, I don't mean to to be morbid with this, but just reminds me, yesterday we we celebrated Aaron's life. 43 years old, y'all. 43, that's a year younger than me, right? It just shows you how precious life is. So let me ask this question. If this was your service we were doing yesterday, where would you be at in eternity right now? Because the Bible makes it clear we're going to spend eternity somewhere. Either eternity with the Lord, eternity separated, eternally separated from Him, which is not God's desire. He died on the cross so that you could be saved. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him, that word believes means to trust, would not perish. And that word perish means for eternity because it says, but have everlasting life. Would you bow your heads with me just close your eyes? And if you say, Brandon, if this was my service, that was here, my funeral service yesterday, I don't know where I'd be at in eternity today. But man, I want to make sure I spend eternity with Christ. And I want a relationship with him today. You say, Brandon, I need to repent of my sin and turn my life over to Jesus. If that's you, just slip up your hand. And I want to pray with you today. I see your hand, ma'am. Anybody else? Anyone else? In the back over there. Young man, I see your hand. Praise the Lord. Over here to my left. Ma'am, I see you. Amen. More importantly, God sees you. All of y'all, as we just read. Anybody else? Say, Brandon, I want to get right in the middle right here. Young man, praise the Lord. Hands still going up right here, ma'am, in the back. Young lady. Young people raising their hand right here, sir. Yes, young man. Praise God. Now, the Bible says if you believe in your heart, that word believe means the same as what Jesus said. It means to trust. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Come on, as we celebrate the resurrection next week, come on, I want to just lead you in a simple prayer. It's more faith and trust in Christ than it is the prayer, but I want to lead you. Those of you with your hands up, let's all pray this together. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and thank you for dying on the cross in my place. Lord, I know that I've sinned and I repent of my sin. I receive the free gift of salvation and I surrender my life to you. And give me the grace and the strength, Lord, to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, can we rejoice and celebrate with these this morning? Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or first time in a long time, there's a card in the chair right in front of you. It says connection card. Fill that card. I'll bring it to the info center after service. We got a Bible for you. We want to pray with you. Why don't you stand up with me? And we want to pray for you as well. If I can get the pastors and the altar team down here. And as we close today, you may be feeling hopeless in here. You maybe have a situation that you're walking through. As I said, we want to pray for other people. We want to pray for you today. 
And if you, you just feel hopeless, maybe you're in the storm of your life, you're in the battle of your life, you feel like those guys on the ship or that servant, and you need us to stand and pray with you, we want to pray with you. For the rest of us, come on, how many of y'all want to be hope to the hopeless around you, right? Is that you? Come on, lift your hands if that's you. Let's ask the Lord to help us this week as we build up. A lot of people are open to the gospel right now. Come on, let's ask the Lord to use us to share our story, to pray for people, to invite them to Easter services. Father, we pray that you would use us today, tomorrow, this week, and every day, Lord, even beyond Easter, Lord, all the days of our life. Help us to pray, Lord, that you. That we pray for hopeless right now that their eyes will be open to see that with eyes of faith and in the spiritual realm, not just their natural circumstances. Help us, Lord, to point them to the Word, to encourage them in the Word, Lord, as we anchor our hope in your Word. Lord, I pray that our faith would stir them up of hope and that you give us the grace, the anointing, and the words to share our story to help give people hope. Thank you for saving us and delivering us. I pray we would share that same story, Lord. We were once blind, now we can see. And help us to, Lord, speak that and encourage that to all those that are hurting, hopeless, and lost around us. May your will be done, Lord. Your kingdom come. You will be done. Use us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Well, God bless y'all. We love y'all. Come on, invite somebody to, to service next weekend. It's going to be a great Easter weekend. We love y'all. If you need prayer, we'll be down here. Somebody wants to pray with you. We love you. See you soon. God bless.